Hello, this is chapter 10, the Jacksonian era from 1824 to 1845. By 1816, many government clerks were earning more than Congress, so Congress increased their own salary. This was known as the Salary Act of 1816, which upset many people and the act was repealed. It was the beginning of popular voice in government, and it, individual states were getting the right to decide on who could vote. Universal white male suffrage became popular in all states except in Rhode Island, Virginia, and Louisiana. By the 1820s, there were written ballots, and voters were given the power to choose their own presidential electors. However, there were problems with balancing too much elitist and too much favoring the middle and lower class. The white male voting became greater than the women and the free blacks. Before, blacks had the same property restrictions as whites, and in New Jersey, it allowed single women or widows with property to vote. However, New Jersey and followed by other states changed their constitution where voting limits did not include wealth and status, but rather gender and race. None of the ten new states allowed black suffrage, and it was only allowed in some New England territories. Religious movements now rejected Calvinism of the Congregational and Presbyterian churches. This led to the Second Great Awakening, which was led by Methodists and Baptists. It caused one in three Americans to be regular churchgoers. Success was caused by the relating to ordinary Americans and the focus in the South and the West. Mass revivals happened and people were favoring salvation. This dissed Calvin's predestination idea. It was an appeal to many women and African Americans because African Americans and slaves were now welcome into the church. Evangelicalism also be but however became limited by race and gender. Was Andrew Jackson an influential figure during his presidency and what was his legacy? Andrew Jackson was an influential figure because he was relatable to the people and got rid of the Indians. However, he lost voters due to the rejection of South Carolina's nullification and the bank war. The legacy that Jackson left was the country in financial ruin, which left Van Buren to fix the economic problems and deal with the rise of abolition movements. Andrew Jackson was born in the southern backcountry with no, no formal education, but got his fame for the Battle of New Orleans. A new Democratic Party was formed, and the presidential candidate was Jackson. However, he lost the election of 1824 to John Quincy Adams, but it was a good thing. The Albany Regency was built by Martin Van Buren. It was an expression of popular will against the wealthy. State leaders and Van Buren began to use the press to gain support for Jackson. Due to Adams representing the elite and Jackson as viewed as the voice of the people, Jackson received much love. Jackson was influential because he was considered the people's president. He wanted to restore the government to the ideals of the Jeffersonian republicanism. He attempted to make office holders based on the will of the people. This led to the spoil system, where the president's party put in supporters for their government jobs. Jackson liked Henry Clay's American system, which called for a protective tariff, national bank, and federal subsidies for internal improvement. Jackson vetoed the Maysville Road Bill, which would have used federal money for a road in Kentucky. He argued that it was unconstitutional because it only benefited Kentucky. This gave Democrats power to make more internal improvements. Jackson lost some votes due to the veto, but he would ultimately gain a lot of support in the Indian removal policy. There were five Indian confederations in the South. In 1825, Georgia made fa a false treaty to get the Creek Indians out of their land. In response, in 1827, the Cherokees made their own constitution, declaring their right to their land. Georgia denounced the Cherokee constitution and put Indians under their own state laws. To Georgia, Indians were seen as tenants and had no legal rights. Alabama and Mississippi followed. Jackson implemented the Indian Removal Act, which got Indians to move to Trans-Mississippi area. This was known as present-day Oklahoma. Choctaws, Creeks, Chickasaws, and Cherokees all left by 1838. With no government control, many died on the way, and it was known as the Trail of Tears. In the cases of the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia and Worcester versus Georgia, both cases were ruled unconstitutional by Marshall. Jackson ignored these rulings and pushed the Indian removal.
The Indian Removal Act got Jackson more support because it gave Americans the right to settle on Indian lands. The tariff of 1828 was when rates were increased to 50%, which worsened agricultural depression, lowered foreign demand for goods, and denounced as an unconstitutional extension of national power. The force bill was proposed by Jackson in January 1833. Asked for and received from Congress full authorization to put down the nullification by military forces. The Compromise Tariff of 1833 lowered duties to 20% but extended the reductions over a 10-year period. Jackson distrusted banks, symbol of privilege monopoly, monstrous institution that deprived common Americans of their right to compete equally for economic advantage, which decreased the support of voters. The effect of Dismantling the bank left economy overheated in his second term. High commodity and abundant credit propelled buying frenzy of western lands and prices soared greatly. The Bank of England tightened credit policies and raised interest rates and reduced credit lines of merchants greatly involved with trade in America. Cotton was the main security for most loans by American banks, which decreased in value, which led to contracting credit and falling prices. Democratic ideology favored limited roles of federal government in economic affairs and in matters of individual conscience. It supported territorial expansion. It was supported by farmers, unskilled workers, Catholic immigrants, South and the West. Whig ideology favored government support for economic development and controls over individual mortality. Opposed expansion, they supported by manufacturers, common farmers, and skill workers. Specie Circular stipulated that large traits of public land could be bound with only specie. Van Buren created treasury system that separated the government from banks. William Lloyd Garrison inaugurated a radical new phase in northern attacks on slaves with publication of The Liberator. Abolitionists began protesting to Congress and South about anti-slavery. They sent anti-slavery literature to South by mail. The South was outraged and demanded to repress the free speech for security. In 1836, the gag rule was a procedural device where anti-slavery petitions were automatically tabled with no discussion. Around 1840, a new second party system began between the Whigs and the Democrats. The Whigs were led by Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and John Calhoun. They argued that Jackson was undermining congressional rule by all the vetoes he enacted. How did the rise of the Whig Party affect politics? The Democrats, having no political party opposition, resulted in the rise of the Whig Party and their efforts to make their mark in politics with their strong beliefs, the election of 1840 and the election of 1844, and the result of gaining power. The Whigs' strong belief was that they viewed the political parties undermined individual liberties and public goods by fostering and rewarding selfish interests. They dropped much of their ideology when they became a political party. They saw government power as a positive force to promote economic development. Another contribution to the rise of the Whig Party was the election of 1840, where the presidency candidates for the Whig Party was William Henry Harrison and for the Democrats, Martin Van Buren. Harrison was liked by the people, just like Andrew Jackson. At the end of the election, William Henry Harrison came out as the victor. The Whigs gained control of both Congress and the presidency in 1840. In addition, there was the election of 1844, where the Whigs' candidate was Henry Clay and the Democrats' candidate was Polk. Polk had an expansion program that enabled them to campaign with much more enthusiasm than in the election of 1840. 
The result was Polk's victory, and he became president. Furthermore, there was the result of gaining power for the Whig Party, which included anti-Masons joining them. Harrison died in office, which left Tyler to rise from vice president to president. He had different views, being a Democrat, and vetoed many bills, resulting in the expulsion of him in the Whig Party. He also wanted the annexation of Texas, and Calhoun agreed that the security and preservation of the Union demanded annexation of Texas. The Jacksonian era drastically changed political life because it appealed to the majority of the people. It also changed voter participation. Voting rights came from gender and race rather than wealth and status. There was also the political party competition between Democrats and Whigs. In the beginning of Jackson's presidency, he, things were going good because he was known as the people's president. However, as time went on, certain conflicts arose, and the way he handled them lost support of many. This led to the Whig party gaining more followers and being a stronger competition towards the Democrats. The main focus between the Democrats and the Whigs originally was economics. However, after the election of 1844, their main concern became slavery.